Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Since time immemorial, people have come across the fossilised remains of long extinct animals and puzzled over their identity. In ancient China, dinosaur fossils have been known for millennia, but they were often interpreted as dragon bones or as traces of gods, great battles and fearsome monsters. In a 2011 paper published in the journal Ichnos, researchers Linda Ching, Adrian Mayer, Yu Chen and Gerald Harris focused on one particular source of dinosaur-inspired myths, trackways found across China. In the case of three-toed theropod tracks discovered in Chabu in Inner Mongolia, for example, the footprints had been known to farmers since the 1950s and were believed to be footprints of a divine bird. This is a common theme across sites where theropod tracks have been found, which is not surprising at all given the origins of birds from within this group of dinosaurs. In contrast, villagers in Changdu County, Tibet, interpreted a trackway uncovered in 1999 as the footprints of a mountain deity. In reality, the tracks were made by a sauropod dinosaur of some kind. These instances remind me of the fossil tracks of the Dinosaur Footprints Reservation in Massachusetts, which were originally thought to have been made by gigantic birds during the early 19th century. Native American groups also have a long and underappreciated history of recognising the remains of dinosaurs and extinct megafauna. Their explanations, expressed in mythic language, were based on repeated careful observations of geological evidence over generations. Fossils of all sorts were collected in the Americas for a wide range of uses, as deeds to land, as historical evidence, as weapons, as healing medicine, and as personal amulets for protection or other special powers. In ancient Greece, the bones of extinct proboscideans were often thought to be the remains of monsters, giants, or heroes. These fossil discoveries may have had an impact on art as well. On a famous Corinthian vase dating to around 550 BCE, depicting Heracles battling the sea monster Cetus, the latter is depicted in a strange way. All that can be seen of the monster is its bone-white head peeking out of a dark void that is presumably meant to be a cave. With its unusual appearance, complete with many teeth, elongated jaws, and apparent sclerotic rings, it has been suggested that the artist took inspiration from a fossil megafaunal skull. Candidates have included a woolly rhino, an ancient giraffe relative, and, perhaps most plausibly, an exaggerated and oversized monitor lizard skull. Historian Adrian Mayer also famously suggested that Greek depictions of griffins were based on an indirect knowledge of protoceratops fossils uncovered by the Scythians. Although this is an interesting idea, I'm not particularly convinced by Mayer's arguments, particularly seeing as she ignores the pre-Greek origins of griffins in Mesopotamia, and the fact that there was not a standard way of depicting these mythological beasts across cultures. Paleontologist and paleoartist Mark Witten has written a brilliant article on this subject, which is well worth a read. During the late 18th century, mythic interpretations of fossils came to be questioned by European scholars. Ancient remains of mammoths, mastodons, and giant sloths were already on display in museums and proved popular with Georgian-era audiences. However, as unusual and novel as these animals may have seemed, they were still examples of mammalian megafauna with recognisable close living relatives. It would take the discovery of extinct reptiles, unlike anything alive at that moment, to introduce the concepts of deep time and permanent extinction that are characteristic of modern paleontology. These ancient saurians often presented quite confusing anatomical traits that posed many difficult questions for the naturalists that first described them. A perfect example of this was the first pterosaur to be scientifically described, the famous Pterodactylus. The specimen was described by Italian scientist Cosimo Alessandro Collini in 1784, based on a near-complete fossil skeleton that had been unearthed from the Solnhofen limestone of Bavaria. Collini thought that this bizarre animal, with its greatly elongated fourth fingers, beaky-toothed jaws, and light frame, may have been aquatic, but came to no firm conclusion as to its identity. This idea would persist into the 1830s, with the animal even being placed in the inaccurate class Griffey, which was also thought to include marine reptiles and the platypus, representing a link between birds and mammals. The German-French scientist Johann Hermann was the first to suggest that Pterodactylus used its long fourth fingers to support a wing membrane. In March 1800, Hermann alerted prominent French scientist Georges Cuvier to the existence of Collini's fossil. 
He wrote a letter to Cuvier describing the fossil, which he believed to be a mammal of some kind, and even included his own speculative drawing of a living pterodactylus. This is the oldest known piece of paleo art to depict a pterosaur, with Hermann's image being surprisingly accurate to modern ideas about these animals, ignoring the proposed mammalian identity. Produced in the year 1800, this illustration shows an animal with a fuzzy coat of hair, membranous wings supported by the fourth fingers, and presumably warm-blooded in nature. These features are now thought to have been typical for all pterosaurs, with hair-like pycnofibers and elevated metabolisms being commonplace in the group. Cuvier agreed with this view, but was convinced that Pterodactylus was a reptile. Hermann had assumed that the specimen had been lost or looted during the Napoleonic Wars, but in reality it was being studied by German polymath Samuel Thomas von Sommering, who gave a public lecture on the fossil in December 1810. His lecture was published in 1812, and in it von Sommering named the species Ornithocephalus antiquus, convinced that the animal was some kind of bat. In 1843, English naturalist Edward Newman concluded that pterosaurs were flying bat-like marsupials instead. This interpretation would prove highly influential up until the 1860s, when Cuvier's reptilian hypothesis became broadly accepted. At around the same time period, during the late 18th and early 19th century, the first large extinct marine reptiles came to light. Among the earliest to be definitively identified was the Cretaceous genus Mosasaurus. The first fossil known to science was discovered in 1764 in a chalk quarry near Maastricht, the Netherlands, in the form of a skull, which was initially thought to belong to a whale. Later, around 1780, the quarry produced a second skull that caught the particular attention of the physician Johann Leonard Hoffmann, who thought it was a crocodile. The skull was looted during the French Revolution and arrived at the Museum of Natural History in Paris by 1795, where Cuvier correctly identified the animal as a massive relative of modern monitor lizards, but still unlike anything alive at the world at that time. The skull became part of Cuvier's first speculations about the conception of extinction, which later led to his theory of catastrophism, a precursor to the theory of evolution. At that time, it was not believed that the species could go totally extinct, and fossils of animals were often interpreted as some form of an extant species. Cuvier's idea that there existed an animal unlike any today was revolutionary at the time. Early depictions of Mosasaurus depicted the genus as only semi-aquatic, being able to clamber onto land like an oversized seal. The most famous early depiction in paleo art came in the form of a concrete sculpture created for the Great Exhibition at Crystal Palace Park in London. Crafted by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins between 1852 to 54, the sculpture shows a blunt-headed reptilian animal with lips reminiscent of those of monitor lizards, scales consistent with those of the Komodo dragon, and large flippers resting above the water. Notably, this restoration was not particularly accurate, even by the standards of the time. In a similar position were the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. When their first fragmentary remains were identified in the late 18th century, they were considered to belong to fish, crocodiles, or some strange hybrid of both. The first complete ichthyosaur specimen was found by Mary Anning and her brother Joseph at Lyme Regis, Dorset, in 1811, being formally described over the next few years. The bizarre nature of the animal led to confusion as how best to classify it, and like Mosasaurus, demonstrated that extinct forms of life could be radically different from modern forms. By the 1830s, it had been determined that ichthyosaurs were a definitive group, belonging to the Linnaean order Reptilia. The general public became fascinated by ichthyosaurs when their remains were put on display at the Natural History Museum in London. Their bizarre form induced a feeling of alienation, allowing people to realise the immense span of time that had passed since the era in which the ichthyosaurs swam the oceans. Public familiarity with these animals was boosted by the works of eccentric pre-Adamite collector Thomas Hawkins, who attempted to combine science and his own religious beliefs by claiming that ichthyosaurs were creations of the devil. In a very strange line of reasoning, Hawkins imagined all of the recently discovered saurians to have inhabited an antediluvian world before the creation of Adam, an alien world shrouded in eternal darkness and sweltering heat. The monstrous animals of this biblical world were detailed in two books, Memoirs of Ichthyosauri and Plesiosauri, and The Book of the Great Sea Dragons, 
published in 1835 and 1840 respectively. The artwork produced for these volumes is truly nightmarish, featuring ichthyosaurs and other recently discovered group, the plesiosaurs, battling in a dark, lightless world covered by primordial waters. This fusion of genesis and paleontology was quite common during the 19th century, as these seemingly literal monsters unearthed from the ground seem to fit well alongside the antediluvian giants of the Old Testament. Just as earlier cultures had interpreted fossils in light of their own mythologies, Victorian naturalists couldn't help doing the same. Fossil bones were blank slates upon which artists and naturalists could project their own imaginations. Adolf Pannemacher, like many artists of the time, inserted biblical and mythological imagery into his paleo art. Here, in his 1857 work, The Primitive World, prehistory appears as an apocalyptic war zone, with both biological and geological violence on display. As the reptiles in the foreground square up for a fight, a volcano erupts in the background, accompanied by fire and lightning. This trope would go on to have a long history, and is continued even in modern dinosaur-related pop culture. Panamaka also produced artwork depicting scenes of biblical apocalypse, into which prehistoric animals seemed a natural fit. Ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, like Mosasaurus, also appeared in sculptural form at the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1854, with the snake-necked plesiosaur looking very sea serpent-like while the ichthyosaur has exposed sclerotic rings and phalanges that demonstrated the internal anatomy of the animal for the viewing public. However, the most famous inhabitants of the Crystal Palace menagerie are the dinosaurs. First receiving their iconic name, meaning terrible or fearfully great lizards, from famed anatomist Sir Richard Owen in 1841, dinosaurs were relative latecomers to the Victorian paleo world. The first of these animals to be recognised was the genus Megalosaurus, named in 1824 by geology professor William Buckland. With assistance from Georges Cuvier, Buckland realised that the scrappy collection of bones belonged to an ancient, carnivorous, lizard-like creature, including a partial lower jaw with associated teeth. However, with the remains being far from complete, Buckland could only fill in the blanks of this mysterious new find with the knowledge of living reptiles. He considered Megalosaurus to be a quadruped and a quote-unquote amphibian, an animal capable of both swimming in the sea and walking on land. Generally, in his mind, Megalosaurus resembled a gigantic lizard, but Buckland already understood from the form of the thigh bone head that the legs were not so much sprawling as held rather upright. In the original description of 1824, Buckland repeated Cuvier's recommended size estimate that Megalosaurus would have been about 40 feet long, with the weight of a 7 foot tall elephant. At approximately the same time, geologist Gideon Mantell had come into the possession of some unusual fossilised teeth that resembled those of an iguana but were far larger. In recognition of the resemblance of these teeth to those of an iguana, Mantell decided to name his new animal Iguanodon, or Iguana Tooth and thought that the living animal must have measured up to 18 metres or 59 feet long. In 1834, a more complete specimen of Iguanodon was uncovered at Maidstone in Kent, which enabled Mantell to draw his first sketch of the animal's skeleton, appearing as an oversized lizard. However, due to the still relative incompleteness of the find, Mantell made many anatomical errors, most famously assuming the thumb spike to be a nose horn. Desiring to make a striking artistic rendering of his animal, Mantell met with painter John Martin, who was well known for producing works that focused on scenes of biblical apocalypse. The two men struck a deal, and the result was an extraordinary painting by Martin titled In the Country of the Iguanodon, completed in 1837. The work depicts a vast primordial landscape shrouded in a dusky twilight, complete with ferns, palms, and other supposedly ancient foliage. In the centre of the image, we can see the intertwined, writhing bodies of an Iguanodon and two Megalosaurus. Both species are shown to essentially be massive lizards, with the Megalosaurus biting its prey on the back and staring directly at the viewer. The curving nature of the animal's sinuous bodies directs the observer's gaze into the background, a swelteringly hot world of hazy sunlight and ancient violence. The conception of dinosaurs being eternally locked in combat would be yet another long-lived trope established by Victorian artists. Both Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and a third, lesser-known early discovery, the armoured Hyliosaurus, 
would later appear as the stars of the Crystal Palace dinosaur display. By the 1850s, better understanding of the fossil record and descriptions of the material by Richard Owen eliminated the early conception of these animals as giant lizards. With the famed anatomists concluding that dinosaurs were more mammal-like, with bulky bodies, erect limbs and active lifestyles. Therefore, the Crystal Palace statues show quite elephantine animals, with a pair of iguanodons, one standing and the other lying down. Meanwhile, Megalosaurus was shown to be a heavily built quadruped with a somewhat bear-like build and a crocodile-like head. These would be the first truly popular and widely known images of dinosaurs, with artistic depictions in the following decades being heavily based on the Crystal Palace sculptures. A famous depiction by French artist Edouard Drieux followed this style, again showing a battle between the animals, much as Martin had done. The dinosaurs appear in a tropical jungle environment, reflecting an early example of the connection made between the prehistoric world and British and French colonies in Africa, something that I have mentioned before in my older videos on supposed Congolese dinosaur cryptids. This bulky quadrupedal vision of dinosaurs persisted until the 1870s, when newer finds from Europe and North America made it clear that Iguanodon and Megalosaurus were more lightly built, and the latter was an obligate biped. This would mark a new phase in paleo art that depicted many dinosaurs as kangaroo-like bipedal animals, with dragging tails and a vaguely anthropomorphic look. In conclusion, the early history of paleo art did not begin in late 18th century Europe, but has a time frame of many millennia. All cultures that encountered fossil remains interpreted them in light of their own folklore and mythologies, and early paleontological efforts in Britain, France and Germany were no different sometimes producing bizarre results as we have seen. However, we should not be overly critical of these attempts, as the naturalists and artists were often working with very fragmentary materials on animals that seemed totally alien and hard to place. If you had never seen the remains of a pterosaur before, for example, how would you begin to classify it, given that the creature is so unlike any modern reptile? The artistic tropes produced in this period of apocalyptic paleo art still remain with us today and are influential in popular culture. Perhaps, in the centuries to come, future scientists and artists will look back at early 21st century paleo art with the same critical eye. Thanks for watching everyone. The next video will cover the early relatives of modern elephants, including the mammoths. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio!